This video is the first in a series responding to a video by YouTube channel Home Team History on the Ishango bone and Lobombo bone, and examines the various theories and myths which have arisen around both of these ancient artifacts. See the video description for a link to Home Team History's original video. I've been following Home Team History's channel for a long time now, and I strongly recommend subscribing to it for quality Afrocentric content concerning the history and culture of Africa and its various peoples, especially on topics which are not commonly treated, and on topics which are commonly treated badly. I find Home Team's videos to be thoughtful, well-informed, and intellectually honest. Please note that this video is not a takedown or rebuttal or even challenge to Home Team's original video. It's a critical response aimed at presenting an alternative, though not completely different, perspective. I'm going to point out some facts which I think contradict some of his conclusions, some facts which I think weaken some of his arguments, and some facts which I think not only support some of his arguments, but actually make them even stronger. There's a lot to cover, so I'll be releasing this response in four parts, once a week. In this video, these topics will be addressed. Firstly, the historical context of the Ashango bone. And secondly, home team history's commentary on the Ashango bone. Historical context of the Ashango bone. The Ashango bone is an archaeological artifact from the Paleolithic era dating to around 22,000 years ago and discovered in 1957 in the Congo. The bone itself is the fibula, or calf bone, of a baboon. Of particular interest to archaeologists and anthropologists are the marks which have been incised into the bone in three columns. Ever since the bone was found, there has been considerable professional debate over the meaning of these markings. Additionally, in the public sphere, the bone has been given a range of interpretations by different interest groups. Let's start with the history of the Shango bones analysis by professional anthropologists. In the late 19th century, French geologist and paleontologist Edouard Latte suggested that the marks found on various animal bones at ancient human settlements were a form of early record keeping, specifically a tally stick. A tally stick was a pre-numeric and non-numeric visual record of quantification. It was a way of quantifying data in the absence of a numerical system or in the absence of numeric literacy. Tally sticks were used extensively throughout Paleolithic Europe and even through the medieval era up to the 19th century. A tally stick differs from a system of symbolic numeracy in that every tally mark typically has the same undifferentiated visual form and the same mathematical value. Additionally, these marks are usually not aggregated into different values. In a pre-numeric or numerically illiterate culture, a collection of what we would call five tally marks is simply read as a mark, another mark, another mark, another mark, another mark. However, sometimes tally marks are used to indicate sets of units. For example, European tally marks are typically grouped in sets of five units, with the fifth mark striking through the other four, as shown on screen now. Similarly, in some early societies, including some early Paleolithic societies, one tally mark was made longer than the others to group sets of five or ten units. The marks on a tally stick can be used to communicate quantities to another person by holding a finger or thumb at the end of a series of tally marks in order to display visually the quantity being communicated. To communicate the quantity 5, you could place your thumb at the end of a series of 5 marks and say, this many. Early numeracy was almost entirely visual rather than symbolic. The number of marks you saw on a tally stick was a visual representation corresponding directly to the number of things you were referring to. Placing a number of tally marks close to each other in a cluster made it possible to demarcate larger quantities easily rather than looking at each individual tally mark. When used consistently, these clusters acted as de facto numerals. Some early tally sticks, like the wolfbone tally stick on screen now, found in the Czech Republic, originally dated to 33,000 years ago but recently redated to 20,000, used clusters of five. When tally marks are consistently grouped in clusters of five, 
Each cluster becomes a proxy for five marks, even though no actual numeral is used, and even if there is no way to express the word five verbally. It must be remembered that tally marks were simplified visual descriptions of quantities people actually saw. They were not a numerical system. If you wanted to express the quantity of five, you could simply point to a cluster of five on the tally stick and say, this many, even if your language didn't have a word for five. It has been proposed that this common clustering of five tally marks was a natural development from quantifying objects using the fingers and thumb, which is a tally system found in many early cultures all around the world. When the Ishango bone was discovered in 1957, archaeologists and anthropologists interpreted it as a typical Paleolithic era tally stick. Although various alternative views have been proposed, after 63 years, this is still the current scholarly consensus. Home Team History on the Ishango Bone Home Team History's video, Were Women the First Mathematicians in Ancient Africa, was published on August 11th, 2020. It's only seven minutes long, and you really should view it before continuing to watch this video. Home Team starts by identifying the lengthy history of mathematics on the African continent, citing the vast collection of manuscripts at Timbuktu. But the manuscripts at Timbuktu give us the clearest proof of its use and function. These manuscripts were the product of Muslim learning spreading to West Africa. During the 9th century, Muslim traders brought Islam to the Kingdom of Mali, and by the 13th century, Mali not only had a large empire trading in natural resources and slaves, but was also a centre of knowledge and learning due to Greek, Arab and Persian texts being imported by Muslim scholars from the East. The earliest of the Timbuktu manuscripts are copies of Greek and Arabic mathematics, philosophy, religion and science, or rather proto-science, which had been translated into Arabic and the local languages Songhai and Tamashek. However, Timbuktu was more than an archive of foreign knowledge. Local scholars not only learned from these imported texts, but wrote their own treatises on subjects such as mathematics, medicine and astronomy. The Timbuktu manuscripts date from the late 13th century onwards. Home Team continues. Anyway, contrary to popular belief, the oldest manifestation of a mathematical concept was discovered in Africa amongst the Labombo and Ashango bones. And with one of these discoveries, according to one scholar, the needs and concerns of African women spearheaded the development of the mathematical sciences. There are three separate claims here, and I'm going to correct some of them. Before I do, I want to make clear that this is by no means a personal criticism of Home Team's research. I've actually spent the last three months preparing a video on the Ashango and Labombo bones, and it just so happens that Home Team's video was released around the same time that I had nearly finished my script. In the course of my own study of the subject, I have found that a vast amount of literature has been written on this topic over the last 60 years, and that quite a lot of it has been written just in the last 10 years. During that time, the scholarly consensus has not changed significantly, but many different theories have arisen, been challenged, and defended. Over time, some scholars have written three or four papers on the subject, sometimes changing their views as they did so. Some claims made years ago about both artefacts have been cited or quoted repeatedly by many scholars, but are extremely difficult to track down and verify for accuracy. Some scholars have written in quite a confusing way about the two bones, or misunderstood each other's research. Even the dating has changed significantly in the last eight years. The bones continue to be studied, and some of the most recent research is barely a year old. Consequently, getting the facts straight is by no means an easy task. I have revised my own script at least half a dozen times while fact-checking, so I can entirely sympathise with anyone who attempts to address this topic. Having said all that, I'll now gently correct two of Home Team's statements. Firstly, the statement that, quote, the oldest manifestation of a mathematical concept was discovered in Africa, end quote, is not quite accurate. The reason for this is the difference between quantification and numeracy on the one hand, and actual mathematics on the other hand. In the field of mathematics, these are two very different concepts, as explained earlier in this video. The earliest true mathematical expressions are found in Sumeria in the Middle East, dating to around 5,000 years ago, 
Written during this era, the Senkara tablets showed the use of symbolic numbers, squares and cubes. Other clay tablets of this time record the use of geometry and geometric algebra as well as calculation problems such as calculating compound interest over a certain number of years. Egyptian mathematical records are the second oldest. The Moscow Mathematical Papyrus, Mathematical Leather Roll and Lahun Mathematical Papyri all date to around 4,000 years ago. They contain symbolic numbers, units of measurement, fractions and mathematical problems which may have been exercises for students to work on. Secondly, the statement that a mathematical concept was found, quote, amongst the Lobombo and Ishango bones, end quote, is not accurate either. Both the Lobombo and Ishango bones are actually much older than home team described, but neither of them are examples of mathematics. They are visual representations of quantity rather than symbolic representations or abstractions. The difference between these two concepts was explained earlier in this video, but here's a brief explanation of the difference in case you'd rather not backtrack. Making five more or less identical marks on the surface of a material, such as sand, wood or stone, is a visual representation of a quantity. Each mark represents exactly what is seen. Five marks, five things. However, this does not require any concept of the number five. This is the same kind of counting that certain animals can perform, but they are not using mathematics. This is simply matching one visual representation of a group of things to an equivalent visual representation of the group. Replacing these five identical marks with one mark of a specific shape is a symbolic representation or abstraction. This does not represent what is seen. Five things are seen, but they are represented by only one thing. There is therefore no visual correspondence between the mark and the quantity, only a conceptual correspondence. Mathematics requires increasingly complex abstraction, which is the opposite of visual representation. One very clear demonstration that a culture does not have formal abstract mathematics is when the language has no words for very large numbers, perhaps only numbers up to 10 or 20, and after that people simply say many. Some very old languages, including several African languages and some languages in Papua New Guinea, have words for numbers up to 10, 20 or 40, and they are always related to body parts such as fingers, hands and elbows, sometimes using two people. An example is on screen now. As you can see, this is quantification and enumeration, but it is not mathematics. It is visual representation, which is the opposite of abstraction. It starts to become abstraction when a single body part, such as an ear or elbow, represents a number such as 10 or 15. This is abstraction because one entity is being used to represent the idea of multiple entities. However, most body numbering systems rely on direct visual representation for the majority of their numbers. As an example of visual numeric representation, on screen now is an image showing various written methods of representing numbers used by various groups of the Bantu people in sub-Saharan Africa. These images all represent numbers using dots or lines in a range of different patterns. However, in each case, the number of dots or lines is exactly the same as the number of things being represented. Three is always represented with three dots or lines, regardless of the pattern. Five is always represented with five dots or lines, regardless of the pattern, and so on. Placing the lines or dots in different patterns does provide a visual advantage, allowing readers to identify numbers quickly without counting the dots or lines individually. This is the same way that the dot patterns on modern dice work. There are always the same number of dots as the number being represented, but the dots are always in specific patterns, so we can identify the number quickly just by recognizing the shape of the pattern instead of counting the individual dots. What's important is that the Ishango bone uses the same system of representation as these sub-Saharan systems. There is a direct one-to-one -one visual correspondence between the image used to represent the quantity and the quantity itself. Five things, five strokes. This is not formal abstract mathematics, this is the use of direct visual numeric representation. Another clear demonstration that culture does not have formal abstract mathematics is when the language has no words for basic mathematical functions such as addition, subtraction, multiplication and division.
Interestingly, while words for addition and subtraction are present in many very early languages, it seems that words for multiplication and division did not emerge until much later. This is very likely because addition and subtraction can be demonstrated visually by physically adding or removing items from a group, whereas multiplication and division are much more difficult to illustrate visually. If you have six stones, it's easy to demonstrate 3 plus 3 equals 6 simply by starting with the group of three stones and then adding the other three. But how would you demonstrate the equation 6 divided by 3? Starting with six stones and taking three away would look like simple subtraction, which of course it is. There is no intuitive way to illustrate multiplication physically in this way. Of course, fractions and decimals are equally impossible to demonstrate physically like this. Home team's third statement that, quote, with one of these discoveries, according to one scholar, the needs and concerns of African women spearheaded development of the mathematical sciences, end quote, is true and is the most carefully nuanced of these three claims. It's very important to note that home team always presents this as a hypothesis rather than a fact, and a marginal hypothesis at that, rather than one which is widely accepted. Throughout his video, home team doesn't overstate the facts or exaggerate their significance. His intellectual honesty is admirable. However, the details of that claim, when it was made, by whom, and in what context, are widely misunderstood and misrepresented. We'll untangle that complex story in the next video in this series. Unpacking all of this in more detail takes a lot of time, so this brief correction of two of these statements will need to suffice for now. We'll return to these topics later for more detailed explanation. Home Team continues. It was originally considered a simple tally record, but recent microscopic analysis has revealed additional notch marks indicating that it may have been used as a lunar calendar. This is a very well-worded statement expressed with careful qualifications. This is typical of the Home Team channel, which always avoids making sensationalized claims and dogmatic statements about contested issues. Unlike many other history channels, Home Team's videos are based on mainstream scholarly research, which is typically assessed diligently and represented accurately. Intellectual honesty is one of Home Team's most important virtues. In the next video in this series, we'll look at scholarly interpretations of those microscopic marks on the Ashango bone and the theory that the bone may have been used as a lunar calendar. However, for now, it's worth considering just one point. Since those marks are indeed microscopic in size, literally invisible without the aid of a microscope, how likely is it that they would have been created deliberately in order to manufacture a tool for mathematical calculations. If you wanted to write a mathematical record or a system of marks used for arithmetic, would you write it using extremely small marks which were invisible to anyone without a modern laboratory microscope? Such a tool would be unusable until the microscope was invented. How could you even be sure of what you were writing? And how could anyone use it after you had written it? Home Team continues making three statements about the Ishango bone. The first row is a series of calculations based on the number 10. The second row contains prime numbers between 10 and 20, and the third is a multiplication table. It needs to be understood that all three of these statements are highly contested in the scholarly literature. There is no general scholarly agreement that this is what the Ashango bone actually contains. Mathematician Lindsay Harrison says, quote, there is debate as to whether these notches give indication of the understanding of prime numbers or possibly just a collection of numbers, end quote, while adding that the Ashango bone, quote, still gives insight to the mathematical possibilities of ancient civilizations, end quote. Similarly, physicist Peter Radman points out the lack of any theoretical reasoning for such an interpretation, writing, quote, no attempt has even been made to explain why a tally of something should exhibit multiples of 2, prime numbers between 10 and 20, and some numbers that are almost multiples of 10." End quote. The point is, there is no interpretation proposing a theory which unifies all these very different proposed features. 
Likewise, Vladimir Pletzer and Dirk Huilbroek reject the idea that the Ishango bone shows knowledge of prime numbers, despite the fact that they believe it does contain evidence that the bone was used for, quote, basic arithmetic operations, end quote. They also state that the makers of the Ishango bone, quote, had probably not yet discovered the concept of numbers and their representation, end quote, explaining that such abstraction only occurred long after the prehistoric era. Peter Rudman explains that the idea the Ashengo bone contains a mathematical table is based on the fact that the marks in the third row include groups of, quote, 3 and 6, 4 and 8, and 5 and 10, among others, end quote. These groups of marks are regarded by some scholars as exhibiting multiplication by 2. 2 times 3 is 6, 2 times 4 is 8, 2 times 5 is 10. However, there is no need to interpret this as a multiplication table when it could just as easily be indicating addition. 3 plus 3 is 6, 4 plus 4 is 8, 5 plus 5 is 10. This would make sense in the context of the common method of counting in many African languages. The image on screen now shows that in the Shamba language belonging to one of the Bantu people, the way to say 6 is 3 and 3, and the way to say 8 is 4 and 4. They do not describe 6 as 2 times 3, or 8 as 2 times 4. This has been recognised by scholars such as Dr. Ron Eglash, who works in ethnomathematics. Citing Eglash, Mamak Getty Zetati and Abdul Karim Bangura write that, quote, The doubling system in the Ashango bone is fundamental to many of the counting systems of Africa in modern times as well, end quote, referring explicitly to the Sambar language as an example. Home team continues. The Shango bone is an important indicator of the scientific progress in Paleolithic Africa. With the advancement of trade among societies, knowledge of mathematics and units of measure became increasingly important. Basic mathematical calculations were also used to predict the effects of drought or floods on crop yields. This is all true, though professional historians would not speak of, quote, scientific progress in Paleolithic Africa, end quote. In fact, historians of science don't even refer to the ancient Greeks as having actual science as we know it. Instead, they refer to the Greeks' body of knowledge as proto-science. This is the term used for all forms of systematized study of the natural world before the scientific revolution. This might seem like a minor point, but it's important to use standard historical terminology in order to avoid confusion. For example, in Paleolithic Europe, anthropologists have found tally sticks similar to the Ashango bone and Lobombo bone, dating to around 20,000 years ago, but they don't refer to European tally sticks as evidence of scientific progress in Paleolithic Europe. In fact, they don't even believe Europeans had mathematics at all until around 2,400 years ago, long after the Egyptians. Home team continues. With the discovery of the Ishango bone, the long-held assumption that African societies were slow to develop mathematical technology was disproved. The Shango bone is certainly important, as it proves that Africans, since the beginning, were using the sciences to solve their problems and to enhance their lives. This statement is based on a misapprehension. It assumes that before the Ashango bone was found, anthropologists believed African societies, quote, were slow to develop mathematical technology, end quote. In fact, even over a hundred years ago, in the 19th century, Historians attributed the origin of mathematics to Africa and said that the Greeks learned it from the Egyptians. In 1810, the well-respected Encyclopedia Britannica said it was certain that, quote, arithmetic and geometry and some of the physical sciences had made considerable progress in Egypt when the mysteries and the theology of that favoured kingdom were transplanted into Greece, end quote. Another 19th century source, published in 1819, identifies the Assyrians as the earliest mathematicians, but also says mathematics, quote, passed into Greece at the hands of Thales, who, having learned geometry of the Egyptian priests, taught it in his own country, end quote. A third 19th century source, A Compendium of Important Facts and Dates, published in 1841, likewise says mathematics, quote, was brought from Egypt into Greece, about 600 BC, end quote. Ironically, all of these statements identify Europeans as being slow to develop mathematical technology, 
Even more, they are all direct statements that Europeans didn't have mathematics until comparatively recently, and that they learned it from an African society. It is absolutely true that many European scholars used to regard African people as deficient in mathematical knowledge, and consequently drew the conclusion that mathematics could never have originated in Africa. Andrew Wallace, an early proponent of Darwin's theory of evolution, cited reports of contemporary African counting systems which convinced him that it was, quote, improbable that our earliest ancestors could have counted as high as ten, end quote. However, even after this, he adds a footnote acknowledging that, quote, it has been recently stated that some of these facts are erroneous, end quote, citing anthropologists reporting that the Australian Aboriginal people, quote, can keep accurate reckoning up to a hundred or more when required, end quote. It should be noted that Wallace held to the long discredited view that some human groups were more evolved than others, and therefore had greater intellectual capacity. His devotion to this scientific error made it impossible for him to acknowledge what anthropologists and historians of mathematics of his own time were saying, that the earliest arithmetic originated in Africa and only passed to Europe comparatively recently. The view that mathematics such as geometry and fractions were developed early in Africa and the Middle East, but only arrived much later in Europe, was taught right throughout the 20th century. Just two years before the discovery of the Ashango bone, an introduction to mathematics written by Alfred Whitehead and originally published in 1911 was reprinted in 1958. In this work, Whitehead states directly, quote, the earliest treatise on arithmetic which we possess was written by an Egyptian priest named Ahmes between 1700 BC and 1100 BC, end quote. He says the treatise, quote, deals largely with the properties of fractions, end quote, indicating he recognised that complex mathematics existed in Africa over 1,000 years before it arrived in Europe. So although it is true that many scholars believed that the earliest people in Africa had little or no capacity for formal mathematics of any complexity, most scholars believed that advanced mathematics originated in Egypt and was only transferred much later to Europe. Although it is now recognised that the earliest extant evidence for mathematics is Sumerian rather than Egyptian, the lengthy history of mathematics in Egypt is still recognised and it is also still recognised that mathematics arrived in Europe very recently, having been introduced either directly by the Phoenicians or indirectly by the Egyptians. To conclude this video, let's be clear about the history of exactly who really was slow to develop mathematics. For about the last 200 years, mainstream scholars have agreed it was Europeans who were latecomers to both arithmetic and mathematical technology. In fact, even today, historians still agree that mathematics was never invented in Europe, even though tally sticks similar to the Ashango bone and the Bombo bone have been found in Europe, dating to at least 20,000 years ago. Given the fact that racists typically claim African people did not invent writing, mathematics, or the wheel, it is ironic that professional historians acknowledge that all three of these were invented in Africa, while literally none of them were invented in Europe with the very slight possible exception of the wheel, and were all imported there from elsewhere relatively recently. Nevertheless, it should not be forgotten that the mathematical systems and knowledge of non-European cultures has been greatly misunderstood, neglected, and certainly underappreciated by Western scholarship, and that this has only been corrected comparatively recently. We will return to this particular point in a later video.